On behalf of the uh, New Jersey Association uh, for Gifted Children, I'd like to welcome everyone in that is watching this newest installment of Stories That Connect Us. We are so very, very proud to have an individual with us uh, tonight that really doesn't need an introduction. If you have any involvement with gifted education, um, there is a name, there's so many names that are out there, but this particular individual has really been one of the pioneers for gifted education across the U.S. And out of respect for our very special guest tonight, I would like to uh, read uh, Dr. Sally Reese's biography before we get started uh, out of courtesy for her and for maybe that one or two individuals that may be watching tonight that may not actually know the full background of this very, very special individual. Sally Reese is the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, a Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor, and a Teaching Fellow in Educational Psychology at the University of Connecticut. She currently holds the Letitia Nieg Chair in Educational Psychology. She was a public school teacher and administrator for 15 years prior to her work at the University of Connecticut. She has authored more than 250 articles, books, book chapters, monographs, and technical reports. She has traveled extensively across the country conducting workshops and providing professional development for school districts on enrichment programs and gender equity programs. Sally serves on the editorial board of the Gifted Child Quarterly and is a past president of the National Association for Gifted Children. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and was named a distinguished scholar of the National Association for Gifted Children. Dr. Sally Reese, it is a pleasure on behalf of NJAGC to welcome you to Stories That Connect Us. Thank you, Mary. It's an honor to be asked to do this and it's a pleasure to speak with you too. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, you know, one of the things that we set out to do here at NJAGC and within Stories That Connect Us is really meet with individuals that may be well known in the arena of gifted education. And, and again, there may be names that we talk to that uh, may not be as well known as, as yourself, but the important job that we want to bring to our audience is for our audience to get to know you more on a personal level, to hear things about your life, experiences, things that you would like to share with the audience that they actually may not know about. So all of the things that I just listed are items that certainly you are so very proud of and many of us already know about. With that being said, Really, let's start to dig into the individual that you are. Let's go back, Sally, if we could, and let's start this special interview with you. And let's talk about the beginning, about where you grew up, mm -hmm. uh, your family, and, and some of the, the, maybe the positive influences that you had as, as a young child growing up. Can you talk a little bit about that for us, please? Yeah, of course. Well, I grew up in Connecticut. I, um, I was born in 1951, so I turned 70 this year uh, in Torrington, Connecticut, which is a small, um, it was a factory city in northwestern Connecticut, beautiful part of Connecticut. Um, I, uh, I'm the oldest of six children, which is a defining, um, it's just really a defining identity in my life. When you're the oldest of that many kids, you grow up with, a, I think, an understanding of sharing, 
understanding of um, taking care of other people, particularly when you're the oldest, and an understanding of the world around you as seen not just by yourself, but by um, many other people. Um, I had a, a large and loving um, Romanian family on my mother's side. Um, my uncle was uh, Raymond Niag. My mother's maiden name was Niag, and he actually is the youngest of eight children. My grandparents actually were born in Romania and immigrated uh, to the United States. Um, and it, when you think about it, my uncle left a, a, a large estate that is all a foundation um, for education and healthcare and probably donated you know, over $75 million while he was still alive. So a remarkable man. My mother was very loving. Uh, and I also on the other side of my family, which was the English side, the British side, the side I think I resemble a little bit more um, physically at least, um, my grandparents uh, could trace their roots all the way back to the early 1700s. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting and diverse, you know, childhood and family structure and marriage of uh, two very, very different people that um, that resulted in my siblings and me. So yeah. I went to um, public school in Torrington. Um, I went to a small, you know, relatively small elementary school. I uh, was always a good student and uh, ended up in a, a middle and high school in the same town that I grew up on and grew up in and, and actually promised myself if I became an educator, I would come back and try to make a difference in my hometown. So that's just a little bit of my background. That is wonderful, Sally. And uh, also being from a large family, I understand exactly what you are talking about when it comes to placement in terms of your siblings and, and really how that defines you as a person. You shared a, a really funny story with me when I believe you were in grades four or five where you actually were made the secretary at your school. <laughs> Can you talk <laughs> yeah, the substitute yeah. secretary? Um, yeah, I was I, in upper elementary school when we had the, you know, the person that really ran the front office of our school had to take a day off or was sick. I used to get pulled from, I think it started in fourth grade, but fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And I would answer. I loved it, by the way. <laughs> I'd answer the phones. I would, you know, take the mail. I would, you know, do things for the principal. Mainly I answered the phone, but I was out of class, which was a really big deal. Uh, and I guess it, in a certain sense, it was a kind of compacting of my curriculum because I, <laughs> I could afford to be out. I, the funny story I shared is that my dad one day stopped in to drop off something for one of my you know, many siblings that uh, were in the school. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I work here sometimes. And he said, well, do you get a paycheck? Do you get a salary? <laughs> You're holding out on us? So I, I, I remember that with, with, great, with great fondness, as do I remember a number of my teachers um, in that school that you know, created in me a love of learning for learning and a love of learning as well. And that actually, um, your love of learning, is, it's actually one of the quotes that we highlight um, with regards to um, your yourself, how much, how you're so committed to learning something every single day. And, and that really shows up. That'll come along a little bit later in the interview, but you're, you are so passionate about continuing the process it's never it's never really over it's never really there's not a stopping point for you certainly no. that we've i've learned that about you mm -hmm. you know as you moved through middle school and high school one of the things that you did share with me is that you were actually in school grouped together with students that were very similar to yourself. And that was, that was profound for you, was it not? Yes, yeah. There were nine elementary schools in my city. And when we got to junior high, at the time they called it junior high, they put, um, I would say, probably the top achieving kids from all nine elementary schools into one homogeneous group classroom. And we were together for two years, seventh and eighth grade. And then most of us stayed together in 
an accelerated um, kind of grouped class in, in high school. So this was, you know, before, I think I had one, I think AP, one AP class in, in history in my senior year. And it was the first AP class in the school. But other than that, I was with the same group of people for six years. So particularly in middle school, we had all of our classes together. We ate together, we had gym together. And I, I think I mentioned to you by the end of eighth grade, I could pretty much predict, um, you know, what some of the individuals in that class would say before they said it. Um, the answers they would give, you know, the, the kinds of things they would say to be funny. I was a little bit more of a class clown, I think. I was less serious about about studying. I was, you know, I was a bright student, but I was less serious about studying. And and really, there wasn't a lot of homework or time for homework in my house because there just was a small house with a lot of kids and a lot of, and my mother, I think in middle school gave birth to one of my younger sisters. And then the second one, I think my freshman year in high school. So I had a lot of family responsibilities, but I, I enjoyed the challenge. I enjoyed the grouping. That wasn't what got me interested in gifted education, but it certainly, um, it certainly challenged me. There were a couple of classes in particular um, that I found challenging and very, very engaging. And it was fun to be with other kids that, you know, were uh, interested in learning like I was. I, you know, Sally, I, I have to say before we go on that I'm sure that there's many people that may be watching this that did not realize that you would ever call yourself a class clown. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's awesome, though. But that's this is what Stories That Connect Us does. It, well, it really a really good sense of humor. And all of my friends know that I have a good sense of humor and I love to laugh. And uh, I used to be a little bit more of a jokester than I am today. But uh, but I, I enjoy laughing and I enjoy fun. And I think it's it's nice. It's nice to be in a situation in school where you could add some levity, particularly to, you know, a class like that. Absolutely. No, I love that. I think that we all need to, to share that same mindset every single day. And, and it, obviously, it's, it's one that you continue even today. So yes, laughing and, and finding the fun in things is certainly so, so very important. So moving on uh, to your college years, which there are a couple of stories that uh, really were intriguing, and, and I really hope that you'll share this First of all, you went to Chatham College. It's actually Chatham University now out in the Pittsburgh area. And you were, you were compelled to go there for a very specific reason. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I, um, you know, when I, I, I did well in high school. I was a good student and I, you know, neither of my parents had graduated from college and I didn't have a great guidance counselor. So. You know, I, I was very interested in attend, attending a women's college. It was 1969, the women's movement was really beginning to, um, to escalate. And I just found myself so drawn to the idea that I could be learning with other women and not be uh, interrupted by having, you know, men that were class presidents and men that dominated discussions. So I applied mainly to women's colleges, you know, Smith, uh, I, you know, I don't even remember all of them, but certainly Smith and Chatham and, uh, and Connecticut College, which at the time was also still in beginning its transition to take men. But I, um, I ended up with a very, very good academic scholarship at Chatham, which was really my first choice because I had read Silent Spring, which is the Rachel Carson book. And Rachel Carson is, you know, if you if one has a personal heroine, she at that time and probably still is one of my top women heroines. She um, she was a, the first ecologist. She was a scientist that um, that exposed the pesticides that killed bees and bugs and birds, and that's where Silent Spring came from. And she died actually because of her exposure to chemicals. Um, and I knew she had, you know, I'd read a number of of her books, um, love the quotes about wonder and nature that she had. And I knew she was a graduate of Chatham. And so when I went there, I fell in love with the environment. I also loved Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh got a bad rap at that time, but it had, you know, I grew up in a very small city in Connecticut. And, you know, we, 
you know, my parents had a lot of challenges raising six kids. I hadn't been to a lot of museums. I'd never, you know, not even been to a lot of restaurants. I had not had the opportunities to go to museums and, and being in that city, I think I did something every single weekend. You know, there were symphonies there. I was elected class president because, you know, I, I didn't run for secretary because there was no boy running for president. So um, I, had, uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful education there. Loved, loved, loved my time. I did do junior year abroad, but another thing that brought me to Chatham was I was an English and a psychology major. And another thing that brought me to Chatham was I had a senior thesis, a senior project that you had to do. And I, I did this really creative senior project. In fact, I think really that's what attracted me so much to Joe's enrichment triad model, because I, I saw it for the first time the real joy of creative productivity. All of the students in my class were doing projects, but mine was a really creative one. I had taken a course on Charles Dickens. So over the course of a semester, I'd read maybe six or seven of Dickens' most famous and most challenging books. And the last book that he uh, wrote, he actually died in the middle of us, called The Mystery of Edmund Drood. And he planned for this to be the greatest mystery ever written. He didn't talk to anybody about it. He burned his notes. He'd gotten fairly jealous because there was another writer named Wilkie Collins who had become fairly popular for writing really the first mystery in the genre, which was the Moonstone. So Charles Dickens decided he was going to show him and write this great mystery. And of course, since he died in the middle of it, he probably, you know, he probably won <laughs> the contest. So I um I read first time I'd really done any research too. I read all of the you know, Dickensian magazines, and all the articles that were out on potential endings. And I, I, I dreamed it and ate it and slept this, this project for months. And one night in the middle of the night came up with, came up with the idea for what I thought was a really new and different and unique ending. And so uh, that was my thesis. I wrote a few pages of the end of, you know, in Dickens style. And then of course I, I wrote a thesis in what I believe the ending might be pointing to all the clues. So I won the senior thesis prize and at my, at my college. And it really started me, I think, on my quest to advocate for creative productivity and creative opportunities for smart kids, because you know, Joe and I believe probably more than anything that if we can increase the reservoir of highly creative and productive people that we'll have more artists, we'll have more inventors, we'll have more writers, we'll have more dancers, we'll have more painters, but even creativity in, in, in areas of general life, you know, more creative landscapers, more creative construction managers, more creative doctors. We, we, believe we need more creative people in the world and that creative productivity should be a goal of enrichment and gifted programs. And I think my early experiences in college, especially, you know, with that project, I had a wonderful professor as my mentor, Professor John Cummins. I, I absolutely adored him. And it was just a marvelous experience for me. And one I wanted to give to other children when I became a gifted and enrichment program teacher and then director. You know, Sally, that, that is an incredible segue to what I want to go to next. And, and, um, and that is your work in the triad program and your eventual way that you met Joe. But right. before we get to that, I want to just note that you did finish college in three years. Is that correct? Yeah, three and a half. Yeah, I finished college in Three and a, I, I started teaching in January of what would have been my senior year. Yes. So I was young. <laughs> I was a young <laughs> But that the, the senior thesis, mm -hmm. I think that you've probably revealed something about yourself with the uh, completing the ending of the mystery of Edwin Drood. That story in and of itself, and this is, of course, your, your own creativity, was amazing to me. We talked about, um, you know, the Broadway production, et cetera, and what could that look like, how amazing that would be. Um, so just incredible, incredible things. So let's, one of the things that you had also shared with me is 
the the wonderful relationships that you have maintained over the years with the individuals that you worked with, I believe, early on in your career as a teacher and how they they have been your lifelong friends because of the work that you began to do in the triad programs. You mentioned a little earlier that you wanted to always give back in some way to your home state. And here you are, this young teacher, and this is the perfect segue to how you met Joe. And and could you talk about that, please? Sure. So I um I decided after I, I worked in in I taught in Pittsburgh in Shaler Township actually. Uh, over the Highland Park Bridge for the, my first two years. And I was an English teacher at a grade seven, eight, and nine building. I taught a ninth grade English. And that's actually where I got interested in education of gifted and talented students, even more, I would say, because, you know, like so many other people, I had one student in one class. Her name was Chris. She was brilliant and turned off and negative and angry. And I just made it my business to be her mentor. And I tried to look for you know, research-based strategies about what I should be doing for her. Actually led me to the University of Pittsburgh where I took some classes. And that's the first time I heard the name Joseph Renzulli. So um, at that point, I uh, returned to Connecticut um, and started teaching in my hometown. Um, also wanted to be closer to my family. And, uh, and in doing that, uh, I got a job at the junior high school I taught language arts and reading, which is a background area of mine as well. And, um, and then uh, essentially became known to people that I was very interested in gifted and talented students because I never stopped talking about it. And uh, we got an innovative superintendent who said to me, I, I made an appointment and I pitched my idea that we should start some kind of a gifted program. And we, we had these kids at that point, they were no longer doing the, the grouping of all of the classes that they used to do. So I asked if we could start doing that again. I asked if we could start an enrichment program. And honestly, the, guy, the superintendent's name was Louis Asparo, a wonderful mentor and friend. And, uh, and he let me, let me loose, let me, he used to say, turn me loose. So I, uh, I actually started uh, at that point, I, I wrote to Joe, I think, I don't think I called him, I think I wrote to him. And he sent me an article, a mimeographed article on the enrichment triad model that he had published, I think in Gifted Child Quarterly in 1976, in 1977. And this was probably right around that time. And, uh, and there were four of us in Northwestern Connecticut. Sandy Turnk was from Litchfield, uh, who unfortunately has passed away. My dear, dear friend, Peg Beecher, who lived in Torrington, but worked in the next district, Burlington, Harwinton. My friend, Jean Gubbins from Simsbury. And we have, I mean, Jean is still, Jean's at the center. She just won the Distinguished Scholar Award from the National Association for Gifted Children. She's been a friend. I spoke with her today. She's been a friend, you know, for all, all of these years, 40 years. And we all started enrichment programs. And we had a lot of visitors. And I was on a couple of statewide committees uh, when I met Joe for the first time. I, I can't remember if it was in a class or if it was at a meeting, but we very, very quickly became very good friends. He visited, of course, you know, he had written about triad programs, but he actually hadn't seen one in action, mainly because um, he put a lot of different component pieces together to create the enrichment triad model. And we all tried, we all impl implemented a little bit differently. We all had, students had type threes, we all had type ones, but he, so he actually got to see a number of different ways. Um, and I think, you know, he obviously was very excited seeing his work put into action. And before you knew it, we had many, many people coming to visit our, our gifted programs. Um, I, at the time was, I used to be a teacher in uh, nine buildings and then I had a half day planning. So. Um, I left the middle school and I, I started teaching in the nine elementary schools. I spent a half a day in each one, traveled, I was an itinerant teacher. Uh, and then over time, you know, we hired another person. So I only had four schools, another person. So I only had you know, two schools. And then I think by the time I left, there were eight or nine individuals associated with the program who all worked there. 
Uh, and then I became the coordinator director of that program and also got to do some um, coordination of professional development for the district. So, but it was during that time that, you know, I met Joe, we became friends. As, as we were friends, he was friends with Peg, he was friends with Jean. And, <laughs> And we had this great circle of people all doing uh, enrichment triad model programs uh, in the district, in that area. So it was very special. So awesome. And, and you know, as, as time moves on and, uh, and things began to happen as far as, uh, you know, both of you together and uh, you're a mom also, yeah. let's, let's get that into, into the conversation too. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the uh, pride and joy and parts of your life uh, are the, these these two beautiful daughters that we talked about also. Can you share a little bit about your girls with us too? Yes, so, so Joe and I have um, two girls together, Sarah, who is a prof assistant professor um, at the University of Connecticut in counseling, a completely different area than me. And got this position all on her own merits, and I should say, and she is a, a mother and a wife, mother to our uh, adorable and beautiful little, little grandbaby, Abigail, and then also Liza, who is 33 and lives in New York as a video editor and is pursuing her uh, MFA. Sarah has a doctorate in um, counseling, counselor education. Liza is pursuing an MFA. She's an editor. She has a podcast called 51 First Dates. Uh, and she is engaged to be married next May. So we're very excited about that. Liza is also, I would say, uh, very, very creative in the writing that she does. She does playwriting, she does stand-up comedy. So we're very proud. And I'm also really, really blessed to have a wonderful stepson. So I've been a stepmom for many, many years. Scott um, and Scott and Lori live in Fairfield and I, we have two beautiful grandchildren. Um, with them and both hard to believe, but one of uh, our granddaughters actually applying to college this year, Samantha, and then uh, she's a senior and her brother Alex is a freshman. So I have many blessings in my life related to family and five younger siblings and lots of nieces and nephews too. <laughs> wow. So that that's so wonderful, Sally. Um, thank you for sharing all of the goodness that you have in terms of your your kids you know all the all the wonderful things that that come back to you in that way and it's so great you know one of the quotes that you shared with me with regards to joe was the following we are both proud of each other there's absolutely no jealousy of one another we are best friends yeah. and um I, I think that this mutual love and respect that you have for one another comes shining through. And uh, when you spoke those words to me, uh, when we were getting prepared for this, it really resonated. Um, he really is your best friend. Yes, I adore my husband. He's my best friend. He inspires me every day. He works so, so hard. You know, he, he has never really stopped. I mean, there are days I could, I would wish that he wouldn't work so hard. Um, but, you know, he's so passionate about what he does. He's so completely committed to the work that he does. He, he believes so much in what he's doing. And I'm so, so proud of his passion and his drive and his energy. Um, you know, there's never been a day that um, I have not been proud of him and not mm -hmm. wanted to not just support his work, but, but also be a part of it. Having said that, it's also been very important to me to have my own identity. Mm -hmm. I, for years have been called uh, Joe Renzelli's wife, uh, a spouse. And I, while I'm proud of those things, I also wanna be known for the work that I've done individually, both with him and individually. So I think that those are really important things to teach young, talented girls and women that while when you have a marriage, it's wonderful to be a part of, a, of, of an identity that's a marriage, but it's also really important and a partnership. It's also really important to have some separate identity. So I was always glad that I had my district work and I've always kind of struck out in slightly different directions. So Joe has completely stayed committed, you know, to school-wide enrichment model and the enrichment triad model and the work that he's done. 
And of course, he served as the director of the National Research Center for 21 years. So he did branch out there. But I, I'm a slightly, I like to do new things. I like to learn new things. So, you know, I, I became involved in studying curriculum compacting in a study. And then I was involved in school-wide enrichment model and, and reading for talented readers. And then I got very involved. Our older daughter, Sarah, had a learning disability, has a learning disability. I'm very interested in twice exceptional kids and bright students with learning disabilities. And that's leading to the work I'm doing right now, you know, on students with autism. I've been very, very interested in gifted girls and talented women. So for me, while SEM and triad have always been a core of my life, something I've always done, it's also been really important that I have, you know, some separate identity from Joe and some projects that I can work on um, that are new and different. It's just a part of the way that I like to learn. You know, Sally, um, this is actually a, a great uh, segue once again to talk about the research that you are doing. You just listed a number of things that probably many uh, that are not aware of it that you're working on right now. As a matter of fact, one of the articles that you have so, been so generous to share with uh, everyone at NJAGC, as well as our viewers, happens to be a piece of research that I think literally when we were planning all of this, it just had come out. Last the, week. Yes, yes. And yeah. the piece that I'm talking about is entitled Understanding the Academic Success of Academically talented college students with autism spectrum disorders. And one of the things that really struck me uh, as we were preparing for all of this, again, has to do with your, your, just your quest for learning and learning about different things all of the time. And one of the things that you shared with me is how your research has really gone in a different direction. And you just mentioned a number of things, not only in working with twice exceptional children, but also another uh, paper that you had written that was specifically focused on 15 uh, academically successful women, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a little, yes. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about both of those for us, please, because our audience is, again, going to have access mm -hmm. to that article that just came out uh, right. on October 21st. And I can't thank you enough on behalf of everybody here at NJAGC for sharing that. Oh, very pleased to do that. Um, so I was fortunate enough to work with a team to get a Javits grant. Um, and that provides you, you know, money for funding. So the funding pays for grad students and the travel and all the things you need to do good research. So we actually just completed, um, you know, a few months ago, and it was recently accepted by the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disabilities, an article on twice exceptional students with autism. And these are 15 college students, either recently graduated or current college students that are attending highly competitive schools. So Ivy League schools, schools classified as highly competitive. And what we did is we interviewed them about their experiences in high school, their experiences in college, what prepared them best for this, what actually was what some of the most meaningful experiences that they had, their parental support, their majors, and all of the kinds of things that you would be interested in knowing. And we, we just actually were able to identify in the article that I sent to you, we were able to identify some of the high school experiences that were provided to these young men and women that they believe most contributed to their academic success in college. And these were things like um, a residential summer programs that you know when they had parents that could afford to do that, but um, honors classes, challenging classes, and really heartening for me, also the experience of being told they were academically talented or being told they were smart. So having a teacher or a counselor say to them, you're a very talented student, you're an academically able student, or actually being identified um, and in a, you know, placed in some kind of an enrichment program. So all of these experiences, including, by the way, extracurricular activities, 
which Joe has been talking about since the 1970s, how important they are. These were the things that made a difference in their college success according to them. And I think what is so good about this is this is a strength-based study. So, you know, our work has been, I think a lot of what gifted education has contributed to education is strength-based educational strategies, instructional strategies. So if you look, and I'm really passionate about this, if you look at the best pedagogy in the world, you're gonna find it in gifted education, creative thinking, creative problem solving, critical thinking, uh, you know, things like future problem solving, things like invention convention, things like type degrees, independent projects, small group projects, simulations, all of the pedagogy that's been so creative in our field, the people that have developed, you know, really cutting edge curriculum, Kathy Gavin's Math Squared, Math Cubed. I mean, these, this pedagogy in our field should be pedagogy that more students get to participate in. And that's what school-wide enrichment is all about. And it's also what strength-based learning is about. And when we talk to these students in high, you know, that were at these competitive colleges, students with autism, we said, what makes a difference? And they said, well, I had a teacher that let me do an independent study. Well, I had a teacher that let me pursue my interest in reading. So interest-based you know, opportunity, strength-based learning, that is a core for these young people that were so, so successful in these very competitive colleges. And it's important to note that most students with autism that start college don't complete. So if we really want to help all kinds of smart kids do better in school, we'll look at what we can do to make them more successful. And that's what this article was all about. Sally, you know, thinking about it, you could just feel your passion uh, coming through in the words that you just spoke about, how much this means to you, how proud you are, and it makes you the individual that you are in taking your work in a little bit of a different direction. But obviously, that's what's driving you today, in addition to some of the other things that you spoke about before. You know, high school is often where things um, either there are maybe things that are offered uh, as far as your AP courses, et cetera. But um, boy, if this is not a signal for us to really sit up and pay attention to what these young people had to say about their experiences and how it really benefited them as college students, I hope we all can hear uh, and listen and read your findings and take that into great consideration. Well, this is what gifted education has to offer, Mary. You know, if, if schools could be places for talent development, this is something that Joe and I have been saying for 30 years, if schools could be places for talent development, there'd be many, many more young people who would not drop out. You know, because I've published on underachievement, uh, underachievement of both girls and boys, but oftentimes also the underachievement of girls in life, because I've published on underachievement, I get so many calls from parents of smart kids that have just lost their way, often in middle and high school. And, you know, I think we do so much that's wrong. We give them stricter teachers. We punish them. We take away the things they love. You know, we deprive them of the very things that bring them joy in school um, because they're not, you know, whether put into remedial education or remedial classes, or they're, you know, they're not, they're not able to do the things they once did because their grades are too low. So I just feel like if we look at strengths more, and if we, we look at young people as, 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 as young people that have talents that we can develop, we have a very, very different outlook on, on what might happen with them and ways in which we can help to develop them in a strength based manner. I think that's, that's the issue. And, you know, Sally, I hope that, um, that people will listen to your words, replay them again, because as you said, this is something that you and Joe have really been talking about for th over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, there are hopefully words that, that we can listen to a, with a little bit more deeply and, and with more clarity. I certainly hope so. And I think that's something that you would love for our audience to hear from you as well. Absolutely. Um, as a final part of our interview tonight, and this 
probably is, is a nice way to kind of bring things full circle. Um, if we could, let's talk a little bit about the Renzulli Academy um, and, and, and what that, that is for you and for Joe, too, what that looks like as well. The Renzulli Academy and Bell Academy. So there, in the last several years, what we've begun to do is to see school-wide enrichment used as something beyond just an enrichment program or a gifted program. You know, we're proud if it's used as a gifted program or an enrichment program. That was initially what we were writing about. But what we found is that a number of schools across the country are using it as a magnet theme or as a school theme. And so I had the opportunity, well, at Bell Academy um, is a school actually in Queens, New York that has used SEM as its core. There are a number of schools in New York City that use SEM, but Bell Academy is a very special place. Um, and it was developed by, uh, by colleagues of ours, friends of ours, um, and it is a place where talents are nurtured and developed. Um, I actually also, with the assistant, uh, then assistant superintendent of schools in Hartford, Miriam Morales Taylor, um, started a school within a school in Hartford, Connecticut, that has expanded to uh, being actually a, a school of about 120, 130 students in Hartford, all of whom could be identified using Joe's three ring conception. So I wouldn't say that they were, you know, they were, they were traditionally gifted. Some, some certainly are, but there are also kids there that are high potential, high, high achievement in one or two areas, but it's a very special place. It uses all of the components of school-wide enrichment, um, uh, SEMR, school-wide enrichment model and reading. They do invention convention, they do history day, they do research projects, they do type ones, they do type twos, they do type threes, they do enrichment clusters. So it's all of the pedagogy that we believe in that's put into place in a school that's been running uh, independently now you know, for about 10 years. I spent a lot of time there in the beginning, named for my husband um, uh, for, for very all the best reasons. and. Uh, and it is, uh, it is a place that I started again with my colleague, Miriam Morales-Taylor, and there's a great principals that have been there, fabulous teachers that have been there, and it's still going strong. So if anybody's interested, uh, call for a visit. The principal's very, uh, very, very willing to have people visit, and you'll see some wonderful teachers and some very, very talented, diverse, and highly creative kids. That is wonderful, Sally, and, and I guess... Uh, what a nice way to really sort of bring things full circle tonight. Your passion really came through uh, just a few minutes ago with regards to all of the work that you've been doing, your current research, the pedagogy that you believe in that needs to be shared across uh, the board with all students, and what the Bell Academy and Renzulli Academy looks like, how it really takes all of those ideas and really puts them into place. Uh, Dr. Sally Reese, I don't think you're done. I think that there's more for you to do. Uh, and I really believe that you will continue to make your mark as an author, as a researcher, as someone that really genuinely loves everything that they do. Um, along with their family. You have shared so many great stories with us tonight on stories that connect us, yes. And I think that many individuals after watching this will say, I never knew that about Sally. And that's exactly what this is all about, really bringing that personal side of, of, of our, our special guest to light. So on behalf of of everyone here at NJAGC. Dr. Sally Reese, we cannot thank you enough Very for your time this evening. That's yes. an honor, and I'd like to just tell everybody in, uh, in New Jersey and anyone listening to this, what, what a pleasure it's been to work with you and how much I support the advocacy efforts of, uh, of what you're doing and also uh, of what everyone there is doing. You know, there's one thing I've learned through a lot of the longitudinal research and the research on school enrichment over the years, and that is that, you know, it's one thing that happens. It's one teacher, it's one lecture, it's one special lesson, it's one invention convention project, it's one small type three, 
And that one thing can change the world. And so if you think of teachers being change agents in the world, everyone listening to this, you know, is, is going to have that opportunity. And uh, because of the advocacy of, and the creativity of so many teachers, so many young, talented students will find their way. So thank you very, very much, Mary. And thank you to NJAGC. And uh, I, I wish you all a very happy fall and, uh, and holiday season as we approach Thanksgiving. Thank you, Sally. Uh, on behalf of NJAGC, I'm Mary Arufo, co-vice president of membership and uh, with special thanks from everyone in our organization to Dr. Sally Reese. Thank you, Sally.